Okay, cool. I'm going to get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. I am super excited to connect with all of you. Some of you are my free newsletter subscribers. Other, others of you are my social media followers. I know you have supported me for, in some cases, many years, and I just wanted to say thank you for that. And I hope you find this format useful. Uh, and at the very end, I do want to say I'm going to open it up for a, a Q&A, and I'm also going to go over our uh, the IO Fund's audited 2021 returns. Uh, there's a press release coming out, and um, our customers receive the audit letter, and I want to go over some of those results with you, so a little surprise at the end. Um, the reason I chose this topic is because in it was around 2012 to 2014 when the walled gardens went up. These walled gardens created two fangs. Uh, they created Facebook and they created Google. Um, this is when third party data started to take the front seats and started to drive a lot of the ad revenue that you see today, specifically across those companies. Um, right now, we're seeing another seismic shift, and it's incredibly important that ad tech investors really pay attention to it right now. Um, and that's because anytime there's a seismic shift and anytime revenue starts to get shifted around, it's a really good opportunity for us investors to find where that money is going. Um, had you invested in Facebook in the 2012-2014 era, uh, you would be doing quite well. So that is partly why these kinds of webinars are really important is because we need to be, um, you know, and we, we need to make really strong decisions around these product changes. With that said, there's evidence that Google could come out actually ahead. So I do wanna say that right now we are somewhat bullish on Google, we don't own it, but I'm really looking forward to that earnings call uh, next week and I will update my newsletter subscribers on it. Uh, but Facebook is certainly being impacted negatively. Um, that There is no question. And in order to know who will be impacted positively, we must look at the full picture and understand why is Facebook being impacted negatively. So that's the point of this. And uh, we will go over the trends that are most likely to take the driver's seat since third-party data is not in the driver's seat anymore. And um, that is uh, towards the end of the presentation. So really quick, um, just a quick background about me and why I am qualified to discuss technology is that I've been covering tech since 2011. I was trained in Silicon Valley. I have been a tech scout for a venture capital firm. I have covered a site for about two or three years. I was the editor and founder of a site where startups contributed content to get their products known and seen by venture capitalists and early adopters. And then I was a developer evangelist where I sat between engineering departments and sales departments, and I presented at major conferences such as Black Hat, Android Developers Conference, Games Beat, and many more. Um, today, my tech analysis is featured in the press frequently. Uh, Fox Business, actually today, NPR, I was on there today. Uh, Market Watch, Forbes, and many more. Um, so that is where you can find me uh, moving forward. So again, we will start by talking about Apple's IDFA changes. What are they exactly? Why is it important? This is where the story starts. Uh, we will also discuss a background on Facebook's audience network. Why is Facebook's audience network being negatively impacted? And if this is the first time you've heard of audience network, um, that's super understandable. And that's one of the reasons I've covered this topic so thoroughly is because it tends to go missing from the discussions. Um, but in order to understand, again, who will be impacted negatively, who will be impacted positively. We have to look at audience network. Uh, and then three, we will discuss how this affects other ad tech stocks. I'm not going to go into individual names. I'm going to give you uh, the trends and the things to look for that I believe will put what stocks will lead um, because I don't care what stocks you buy. I just wanna help as much as I can in terms of putting you in a good position to make these decisions. So uh, we will just talk broadly speaking the qualities and the trends that I look for in this kind of a shakeup. Um, please note that the material presented today are opinions. It is not financial advice. Um, I happen to be uh, presenting this during earnings season, but I'm not making an earnings call. I started covering this four years ago. I'm a very long-term thesis type tech investor. So I'm not making a call on, on Facebook's earnings. And, uh, but I do believe over the next two years, there will be meaningful erosion to their ARPU, and I believe that other um, companies will benefit. 
Um, whether that happens in Q1, Q2, Q3, I don't know. But I think in the long term, uh, it's certainly going to happen. And in the last earnings call, they discussed losing around 10 billion, which interesting enough was the number I had put on Audience Network. And I also want to discuss with you why I think it'll be actually bigger than 10 billion potentially. Um, so that's some of the key things we'll go over. So when we talk about the, uh, the I, I call it ID for, uh, for advertisers, but it's really the identifier for advertisers. Um, it's a mobile device ID and it's unique from cookies because it's extremely persistent. You will tend to clear your cookies very frequently, uh, but uh, a, a mobile user rarely resets an ID. Uh, sometimes it requires getting a new device before they even think to do that. So when you take an action on your mobile device, attribution and measurement can go on for quite some time, uh, weeks. So if I make an action today, um, you, can, um, you can run attribution and show which marketing channel that came from two, three weeks later. That's really unique. That's very different. Um, and then of course, the other thing to know about the IDFA is that mobile, uh, specifically iOS, drives a ton of revenue. It drives two thirds of mobile revenue, which is actually quite remarkable because it's um, because it only uh, because uh, it has about one fifth of the penetration. So mobile uh, iOS users, they just spend a lot more. They're worth more. So anything Apple does with its real estate uh, to this level is extremely important. This ID has been instrumental in driving the, a lot of the revenue that um, public companies have been reporting. And um, the other thing to know on mobile is that there's additional device signals. So you have things such as location data. That kind of thing is not available on browsers. You're usually at home. And there's other things. There was at one point called the app graph. It could tell what other apps were on your device. It's leaky. It has a lot of data. And then not only does it have a lot of data, your mobile device constantly leaking data, it's extremely persistent because of this ID. So they can track you for an extended period of time uh, past the point that you take an action. So the point that I want to drive home again is that as investors, um, we battle a lot of noise. There's a lot of information coming our way, but when a company as big as Apple makes these kinds of decisions about their real estate, you want to stop and listen because they control so much of the mobile revenue. Um, Google is talking about and tends to confirm and then delay uh, the similar changes on Android and Chrome. So get comfortable with this topic. It's not going away. And the main thing to know is that, uh, you know, getting in front of it is where I believe the gains will be. So there's two main uses for this ID. The first one is, be, uh, one of them is behavioral targeting. That happens to be Facebook's sweet spot. Um, so you're aggregated and anonymized for targeting. They don't know your first and last name. They're not using things like that. They're using this ID. And later you can be served personalized ads. So if you have booked a flight to Hawaii, they can start to target you and personalize ads for your trip while you're, on, while you're in Hawaii. You might see hotels, you might see Delta Airlines, things like that. Um, that is assisted by this ID. The other thing that is assisted is, um, and like I said, attribution can often occur for weeks, weeks at a time. So it's persistent and highly accurate. Um, they can also measure the effectiveness of the ads that you're seeing if you convert. Did you go to the website that you saw an ad for? Did you complete a purchase? Did you install the app you saw an advertisement for? That kind of granular data is what is being shared across this ID um, that has now been deprecated. Um, it allows the acquiring channel to get credit for the action that is taken. Uh, in this case, that is often a company like Facebook. Um, but I want to go into um, more of the why. I think that the why is probably easier to understand in terms of the bigger picture. What, wh why is Apple doing this? What is Apple's motivation? Well, the user acquisition market is worth $118 billion. And if you watch what's going on with the iPhone, it's flat, maybe saturated, whatever word you want to use for it. 
um, growth year over year doesn't necessarily happen anymore for um, that segment for Apple. So Apple's sitting on all of this real estate. Why not try to move more towards monetizing your real estate? Um, I've seen some criticism come out towards Apple over this, and I think that's misguided because I think it'd be very strange if Facebook let Apple onto their real estate um, to capture a lot of the revenue. Uh, in, in general, you've built that audience, you've built that app store, and the app installs uh, in the bigger picture. Apple's motivation, in my opinion, is for them to move closer to monetizing the app installs. Um, so at this point, uh, attribution um, through the SK ad network uh, is happening um, on Apple servers and the data is entirely cleansed the personalized information before it's shared. So that starts to lock out those that are collecting third party data. And I'm going to go into a very crystal clear picture of the differences between third party data and first party data so that these terms are fully understood. Um, at this point, because Apple controls the real estate, their attribution API has some serious advantages. They can say click date, add group ID. They can um, tell you which creative set had caused the, caused the conversion, things of that sort. So Apple controls a lot of this now. And that was the move that has been made. And I believe the why is so that they can inch closer to monetizing their real estate more effectively. Now that the iPhone uh, is flat to lumpy, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so that's the background on the IDFA. Let's talk about how this affects Facebook. Um, first and foremost, uh, unless we cover this point, the rest would be quite confusing. Facebook is not only a family of apps. So I'm showing Mark Zuckerberg here. You probably have seen this spread of their logos many times. It actually is missing something. Um, you have WhatsApp. You have Messenger, you have the Facebook most people know, we have groups and we have Instagram. But audience network is entirely missing from this picture. Um, and audience network is the furthest thing from a family of apps. Um, it's an ad network that collects a lot of data outside of Facebook. So it's essentially collecting data across 40% of the top 500 apps on the market. These are the last available statistics on audience network. Um, I believe it had grown beyond this. Um, it was reaching 1 billion people in 2016. Again, not on Facebook's properties. So not on Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, outside of those properties in a third party relationship across the top 500 apps on the market. Um, it's likely much higher now. And at the time it was twice um, as many people as Instagram and twice as many people as WhatsApp, just to understanding of the scale. Um, the reason I had guessed it would be about 5 billion to, to 10 billion in revenue is because Google has a similar setup uh, through their acquisition with AdMob, and they were making about 17 billion in third party network uh, revenue. Um, Google breaks it out for you, uh, at least as of a year ago, they were. And Facebook does not, but I did some basically reverse math, and I figured it was between 5 to 10 billion in 2018, and most recently, Facebook has come out and said it would be about 10 billion. So one thing that's really important to understand is that by monetizing 40% of the top 500 apps on the market, by monetizing 1 billion people outside of your actual um, apps, the apps that you own, um, you may be driving in 10 billion in direct revenue for that ad network, but what is the contribution in terms of third party data that that ad network is is contributing to your actual targeting on your own properties. So let me try to explain that a little bit better. Um, in 2016, right here, um, Facebook started to show a serious divergence in North America. Um, you can see the worldwide here and you can see the United States here. Um, one reason is what we discussed about the fact that iOS is just worth so much more and more people in the United States happen to be on iOS, more people in the United States happen to complete actions and buy things than other um, countries. So that's one reason. But the other reason is likely because this is when audience network began to reach scale. Um, and the thing about audience network reaching scale is that 
what's valuable is not this five to 10 billion in revenue. What's valuable is all the data from the 40% of the top 500 on the market. And that data can then inform the ads across these properties. So what is the data worth when you have 40% of the top 500 apps on the market? That's the question that has not been answered. And I think it will take a couple of years to figure out, but I believe that this chart is starting to show you the value of that third party data that is being collected across the top 500 apps on the market and beyond. So another way to look at this is if you look at North American ARPU, which in this case, um, I think Snap has about 100 million uh, North American users, and I think Facebook has about 180. So it's not that big of a gap. I know that Facebook has 2 billion, but when you strip out global and you look more at North America, um, you still see some super unusual stuff going on here. Um, why is Facebook able to monetize so much more effectively than others? Um, I believe that some of it's the behavioral targeting, and I believe some of that, which Apple has brought into question now, but I also believe some of that behavioral targeting is being powered from having so much data collection outside of their actual family of apps. So across those 500 apps, the top 40%, that data, I believe, is powering um, some of this average revenue per user. Okay. So let me see if there's anything else I want to say about that. The other thing I guess I would say is that um, around this time, around this time here, um, Facebook was starting to warn of what's called ad load issues. So that's due to the limited real estate within the social networking apps. Uh, essentially, if your user growth is flat in the United States, which it has been for some time, there's only so many ads you can see like a newsfeed. Um, and so that would be basically ad load. Despite warning of ad load issues, Facebook went on to skyrocket average revenue per user. And it actually doubled their advertisers at the time from 3 million to 6 million. So the question is, how are they fitting all of that in if they had ad load issues? And one potential answer to that would be, well, they were serving ads across, you know, these other apps, all of these other apps, and therefore ad load was no longer an issue. Um, so this is uh, moving more into a hypothesis um, on the fact that the 10 billion is probably a beginning point, not an ending point in terms of the effects of cutting off third-party data. Um, cool. Okay, let's see here. I'm trying to see if I've missed anything. Um, so I want to tie everything together that we've talked about so far. Um, so ultimately, um, Snap and Unity have been doing pretty good throughout these changes. Um, both are heavily dependent on iOS revenue. Um, so it's not a matter of iOS and mobile revenue um, falling off a cliff for everyone. It's unique to Facebook. And the reason why it's unique to Facebook is because of the third party data that they're collecting outside of their family of apps. So their family of apps is first party data. Audience network is third party data. Um, Unity and Snap have to happen to leverage first party data. So Unity sits very close to the publishers and they are able to, um, and many, many companies do, and we'll go through some others. But uh, I'm just giving you an example of a couple of companies that are very, very, very dependent on mobile iOS revenue. Um, and Unity especially um, primarily makes a large majority of the revenue from that. And they've been beating, meeting and beating uh, guidance because they're from the first party revenue side. So it's not an Apple has changed things to the point no one is making money. It's that Apple has cut off third party data. While these companies have been doing well with their earnings reports, Facebook on the other hand is stating we have substantial headwinds to work our way through and that the overall targeting and measurement headwinds are going to moderately increase um, as we go through Q1 and throughout 2022. What I believe that's saying is that third party data is their substantial headwind that others were not relying on nearly the way that Facebook has and that 
um, it's only going to get incrementally harder for Facebook as that third party data starts to wane. Okay, so this is more or less what the advertising landscape looks like. And um, again, one thing I want to say is even though we're talking about um, the IDFA now, uh, Google is talking about following on Chrome and Android. When that happens, um, that seismic shift will be complete. Uh, we're kind of in the middle of it. I would give it a full two years, and I think it's quite the shakeup in advertising uh, because it had created those walled gardens that drew in so much revenue based off third party data. Um, so my thesis here is pretty simple, which is that you can't measure conversions if you don't have a relationship with the apps or websites where the conversions are occurring. Um, so if I had to guess, my guess is that these people over here, closer to the publisher side and closer to the audience will fare better. Um, we made that guess a while ago, and we're seeing quite a bit of evidence that that is correct, uh, because that is where Snap and Unity sit. They sit over here to the right. Although Facebook does with the Facebook that you use with your friends and family and Instagram, they sit over here, but with audience network, they're more to the left. Um, and so audience network is the issue as we've discussed in detail. Um, but we had actually entered SNAP the last previous earnings report for that 58% gain in one day because we felt there was a lot of alpha to be made by having um, that knowledge that publishers were more likely to come out of this stronger than those that have uh, third party data powering their ads. Um, in SNAP's case, it's first party data, Unity first party data. I'm just giving you guys some examples. Pinterest is first party data. Any publisher you can think of as first party data. So um, we just think in a world where cookies and IDs are going away, that there will be an advantage to having the relationship with the customer directly. Um, and that's where it's really important to understand that there is some exposure to companies like Facebook where it's not just the relationship directly with the customer, they're collecting data in a third party manner. The other thing that's really important to understand is that the demand side, so over here on the left, the demand side has ruled leading up to now because cookies and IDs could fill in the gap um, to where the demand side can measure, personalize, and look at attribution without having any publisher relationship. That has been the era of 2010 to 2020, whatever you want to call the last decade. Um, the demand side has ruled. Um, because of these cookies and IDs. Now, if they go away, we fully believe the publisher relationship will take the driver's seat again. That is great news for me because I'm not a Facebook investor and I am an investor in publishers and I am an investor in the supply side. So um, this isn't like a bad thing at all. This is actually a really good thing because there's what Facebook's loss is going to be others that gain. And um, I do want to encourage you, though, to do your own due diligence. I'm just simply giving you my opinion. Um, so far, so good on that opinion, which was carefully laid out over the last four years across seven pieces of analysis. And um, we did continually encourage people to look at what Apple was capable of since it was a real estate owner. And we leveraged ourselves over onto the supply side while this was going on. I don't know that Facebook is going to take, uh, sink like the Titanic. Um, I think there's just going to be some shaving of the revenue as time goes on and shaving more and more. Um, I think the most um, interesting chart here that I've shown you today is probably this one. Um, and this one, uh, I think that that might come down a bit. Uh, and where will it go? I don't know, but it doesn't have a lot of um, reason as to why it's first party data is that much more valuable than the others? Um, and so that's the question that is going to be answered in time. So, so far in the presentation, um, you know, these takeaways is that third-party data is, um, uh, third-party data is more or less kind of going away. Um, it's being phased out, let me put it that way, at least on iOS, maybe some over time on Chrome and Android. Um, first party data is taking the lead. So it's been a third party cookie world 
third party data has ruled the ecosystem, but the shift is moving more towards publishers on the first party side. Um, as stated, I see this as a positive. Um, I believe that Facebook's loss will be another ad company's gain. Um, when I say Facebook's loss, I'm not making an earnings call. I'm saying there will be a gradual erosion to Facebook's revenue and ARPU over time. Um, can they come in with a metaverse play or something like that? Yeah, but that's outside of the scope of this presentation. This presentation is trying to say that this big ad tech company that has controlled so much is now losing some of the reins. Um, so I actually put a little dirt bike guy here because I feel like there's high stakes. I feel like, uh, you know, it, advertising is high stakes because there's so much money pouring into advertising. It is a tried and true industry. This industry has been around for decades and decades. Um, so it's high stakes. And in this case, number 28 is pulling ahead. I believe, uh, like I said, the era of third party data, it is literally officially over. Um, the effects will take longer to play out. Um, and when I say it's officially over, I say that on iOS, it Chrome and um, Android need to catch up. Google has made statements they plan to join Apple in this. Um, so this third party data era is phasing out essentially um, over time. And first party data on the supply side is most likely to benefit in my opinion. Um, contextual, I do wanna to touch base on contextual and publisher segments. Targeting can still absolutely happen. Um, it'll lean more towards buying gaming revenue on a Unity platform because you know everybody there is a gamer and you can just simply buy you know, 18 to 24 year old gamers. Um, if I'm reading a finance article, uh, Charles Schwab and American Express will automatically wanna buy uh, that audience because we've qualified ourselves as interested in you know, financial news. That's contextual. Um, contextual start to take the lead. Um, what else can potentially happen out of this is if I am a publisher, um, I can actually create publisher segments. So if Nordstrom's has determined that, you know, women over $100,000, making over $100,000 on the East Coast is their high value users, um, you know, Pinterest or Snap or whoever can create segments that are of women who make over $100,000 on the East Coast and they can sell that to Nordstrom. So Targeting will continue to happen. The difference is that it will be informed primarily by first party data. And I just want to make a reminder that it will take time for all of this to play out. So that's me. I'm the emoji. Uh, she's got eyelashes and she's super excited about something. Um, what I'm excited about is I believe CTV ads have compounded tailwinds. There's a few connected TV ad stocks on the market. Um, watch them closely. Uh, I personally am not letting the market shake me out of my hand on these. And the reason is that on an incremental basis, first party data on CTV ads now is more valuable. Um, and that's because you can actually run omni-channel uh, marketing campaigns using CTV ads for attribution and measurement. And you don't even need to go through Apple necessarily. Um, so these guys can control a lot because they have such valuable first party data um, from that angle, rather than mobile being the anchor for omni-channel and having all the attribution and measurement, CTV ads can start to kick in for some of that too now. Um, and that happens to be perfectly timed to pay TV ad budgets migrating more and more over to connected TV ads. Um, ad, um, advertising, uh, ad video on demand is a newer market. So we saw Netflix stumble just as a reminder, subscription, video on demand, subscriptions basically, um, have been around for 10 to 12 years. It's an extremely old market in the tech world. I mean, it's ancient. <laughs> but um, advertising video on demand is not an old market. It's a very new market. It came out around 2018 um, and it started to really pick up during COVID. Uh, but the pay TV ad budgets have not fully migrated over. So we have some compounded tailwinds, in my opinion, which is an interesting comment to make because ad tech has been so beaten up and because supply chain issues have resulted in low ad spend. I see that as a very transient. That is not the kind of thing that um, we let affect our positions. We're looking for, uh, in fact, if anything, we double down during those times because anything temporary tends to create very good opportunities because the clouds clear, the sun comes out and boom, ad tech is, our ad budgets are now back to normal. 
money starts pouring in, that is what will happen after supply chain issues ease. So that's not the that's not what to focus on, in my opinion. What is to focus on is the fact that um, you have all of these things lining up, which is that mobile is incrementally weaker in some areas. Connect TV ads is now incrementally stronger if you're somebody who's trying to run a very targeted campaign. Um, I'm drooling over who will be Netflix's supply side partner um, on CTV ads, but ultimately we know that a heavy weight is moving over into this market as well. So that's extra. It's extra exciting for someone like me. Um, let's see here. Okay, so I was actually going to give you guys um, to wrap up um, our 2021 returns. Um, just so you guys know, we pay uh, quite a bit of money for this. We go through an extensive audit. The audit letter is shared with our customers. Um, and uh, if you haven't seen some of our performance before, it's been quite good. Uh, we've actually been audited four different periods since we started. Uh, we are only, how old are we now? We're about two years old on our portfolio in about a month or so. Um, so we're just shy of two years old on bringing a fully transparent portfolio to the market and tech. The research site has been around a little longer. Um, and we also offer real-time trade alerts to your phones. And we have webinars like this. And there's a community forum. And lots and uh, when I say in-depth research, we publish about 10 pieces of research every month. It's substantial. Um, we're a team of specialists. So I'm from the tech industry. We have a financial analyst. Uh, we have a equity analyst and a portfolio manager who is in place for risk management. He has been managing portfolios since the great financial crisis. So overall, we're just a team and I wanted to give you guys our returns um, and share those with you. Our returns last year were 11% and we put ourselves up against other all tech portfolios. So we don't hold value stocks, commodities, anything like that. And so that's why we compare ourselves to ARC and Morgan Stanley's inception fund. And uh, across the board, actually we had a stronger lead technically in 2021 than 2020, um, which shows that in my, you know, which shows that we can uh, navigate turbulent times uh, as well, if not better than the good times. So I'm really proud of my team for this. And uh, you'll see a press release come out uh, I think that last year actually sep separated us more than even 2020. So um, I just want to say thanks, everyone. And I would love to take some questions. Oops. Okay, someone's asking. Oh, someone says audience sounds choppy. Oh, shoot. I hope the audience was, uh, I hope the audio is okay. Someone says it sounds choppy. Um, Okay, uh, I just got from my team, my audio is fine. So that's good to know. Um, okay, so let's see here. WhatsApp from anonymous attendee, any idea color if Facebook is using the data they gather on WhatsApp to monetize their user base, would that fall under audience network? Uh, so they are, they, the 19 billion they spent was to buy a bunch, was to buy that many phone numbers, really. I mean, that's, personally identifiable information is PII, then that really brings them closer on targeting. And if they can like merge some of that data, I believe with Facebook Messenger, it just can create a lot of great tracking and targeting. So yeah, I mean, I understand your point. Your point is probably uh, no, and no, that does not fall under audience network. But the point to that question is to how does WhatsApp help Facebook's monetization? It helps it quite a bit. And Facebook will certainly still have a strong ad platform. It's just how strong. Since, let's see, since, yeah, okay. So since Eric is asking, since Google controls operating system for their phones, is this a net benefit for them once they implement the privacy changes? Um, it is a net benefit because Google is such a massive publisher. Um, even though we spend a lot of our time on you could, I, I do not actually spend any time on Facebook, but people spend time on Facebook, but then they leave Facebook and they go through the rest of their life. But the search engine is constant, right? Like constantly um, people are using the search engine and then YouTube, 
So they will become stronger, uh, in my opinion, in this situation. And that is something that Facebook has confirmed on their last earnings call. If you're a Google investor, if you're interested in what I'm saying, go back and listen to their earnings call. Um, they left a little nugget there on Google and we're watching them going into this earnings report. Um, knowing that this could be quite gradual if this Chrome and Android change does happen, I believe Google could become you know, quite more attractive, even more attractive um, from those changes. Curious to hear your views on demand side platforms in general and in contrast with supply side platforms. I, so I guess, um, so a lot of times people ask me about the trade desk. I think the trade desk has a really great global presence. And then they also, I think are really dependent more on browsers. So I think the browser Chrome kind of stuff would be more important to pay attention to for them. Um, they're also very strong on CTV ads. So the only thing that I can tell you as far as our positioning is we believe that there might be more alpha on the supply side because the demand side has been leading for so long. And I believe by the time this thing is done over the next two years, the supply side will be leading. And again, it goes back to the fact that third party data is being phased out. First party data is leading. Um, and if first party data leads, supply side could potentially do a lot better. Well, not potentially 90% chance, 80% chance of doing better. I'm not going to give you a hundred, but <laughs> anyways, I hope that makes sense. Um, Netflix has all the data they need about the users. Why do you think they will need an SSP? Why not sell ads directly? Um, they said that they're going to just focus on content. And I think that launching an ad strategy would be really tough. They might do what Disney did, which was they used an SSP but while they built their own. Um, but to bridge that, it might, um, you know, to bridge while they build it, they will probably use an SSP. So again, like I said, I'm drooling over finding out who they're going to use. Um, from Pavan, hey, Beth, appreciate your insights. What is your conviction on Fubo? So, you know, I've continued to hold Fubo. Um, we were really clear with our premium members in January when it was at 15, our original recommendation was actually 16, but we did buy at least once at 20 or 25. And I said to my premium members, it's a moonshot. And I made it really, really clear it's a moonshot. Um, and I had always made that clear, but I literally visually changed it on the portfolio so that people could see it every time they log in, it's a moonshot. And that was at $15. So I fully uh, accept the risk in tech. I'm, and it's a small cap. So our allocation is incredibly low. Um, so let me give you an example. Uh, Bill Ackman owned Netflix. I don't know exactly what his allocation was, but if you have a large allocation to a, to, to a safe haven stock like Netflix, you've got to get out because like I, you know, NVIDIA is one of mine. NVIDIA is a very large uh, allocation. I think it's about 13%. If that thing starts to drop too much or like takes a big haircut and has a big change in story, which it won't, I feel very confident in NVIDIA we would have to question that position. Fubo is such a low allocation. It's a small cap. It doesn't really have a big impact on the portfolio. I wanna see what this company can do. As you saw with Netflix, the number one thing is media growth. They got hammered on that. Uh, Fubo has been growing their audience. So we're hanging in there and that's the best I can tell you. Okay. Someone's saying, I'm trying to figure out the math. If audience network is worth 10 billion, that seems about 10% of revenue, even if it goes to zero, then ARPU would not decline that much. What am I missing? I agree on CTV, very exciting. Okay, so I totally know what you're saying. What I'm saying is that it's the data from audience network that is likely powering a lot of the targeting on Facebook's newsfeed. So let me try to see if I can give you an example. Let's say that I have, so Facebook, from my understanding, its audience network was used for things like the New York Times and Hulu, um, the connected, you know, the, the app on your connected TV. So let's say that I'm a finance person, but I don't ever talk about finance on Facebook. I don't ever talk about finance on Instagram. Um, I'm just giving you guys an example. But when I'm on the New York Times, I'm in finance articles and I'm watching all the stock news. When I go back to Facebook's news feed, they can now sell me to American Express and Charles Schwab and whatever, TD Ameritrade, because they knew I went to New York Times 
what read finance and now came back to their newsfeed within the confines of Facebook's first party data. They don't know that I'm a finance person that reads a lot about stocks. It's because they use all the data on audience network across all these other properties that they're able to track my, my activity and they're able to then aggregate me as an audience and sell that even on Instagram and Facebook. So I hope that makes sense. Um, let's say they work with Expedia, maybe they might actually, I can't remember. If I go to Expedia and I buy a trip to Hawaii or Rome, and then I go back to the Facebook news feed, um, basically how like they, they can track all that and they can now serve because of the ID, they can now serve me ads for Hawaii hotels. Facebook is very lagging. So you're not gonna know I'm going to Hawaii until I've already gone and I take pictures and then I put it on after I'm done. So in this case, um, it's audience network that potentially would be powering the data or the, that would be powering my, um, excuse me, tracking my activity in order to target me within Facebook's newsfeed. So now if Facebook is equal to all the other publishers and it can't tell that I booked on Expedia, it can't tell that I read financial news on New York Times, what's the value of the Facebook newsfeed? Um, what I'm sharing on Facebook is not enough to show you that I went to Hawaii, I'm going to Hawaii or that I read finance. It's what I'm doing outside of Facebook. Um, how does someone invest in the IO fund? Is there a ticker symbol? So we are actually an alternative to ETFs um, and mutual funds. What we try to do is just tell people what we invest in and we give them our research. I do want to say um, we had, in my opinion, excellent results last year, but we are not immune to the effects of the recent sell-off. Um, we have been buying it uh, a little bit here and there. Uh, actually, there are moments that we were buying quite a bit. Uh, we feel very good about those purchases, but the last couple of months have been very hard on tech investors. And so um, we are, you know, um, we are very pleased with our results last year, but we, you know, we are, um, we're part of the tech community, tech investor community. And I think we'll do just fine long-term and um, we share our research, we share our losses so that you guys know right now, losses are super normal. If you don't have losses, then you're probably not in the tech industry, you know, a tech investor and tech investors have to get comfortable with losses. Um, so we show our losses uh, and we show you how we handle them. We show you full risk management. And I think that's super important. So I've been down on certain stocks 60% three or four times before they were up four digits. Um, and showing you the fact that I've been down 60% before they were up four digits is the point of our site, is to show you that losses are actually quite normal and we prefer to buy and hold um, with some risk management. We don't buy and hold all the time, but um, we like close Teladoc at the top, things like that have happened. Um, we tell people to trim Roku at the top. We've told people to trim Zoom at the top. Um, things like that are frequently discussed on our site with Knox Ridley and Bradley Cipriano and Royston Roche. Um, they all help out with that. So I hope that makes sense. We're trying to show people how to effectively manage tech positions um, and losses are absolutely normal. Um, so what's your take on the Trade Desk's universal ID? I think it's a hard sell because the people who are getting rid of these IDs have to accept them. Um, so that's Google and Apple. Um, if they're getting rid of cookies and IDs, I don't know why they would allow a universal ID, but we'll see. Um, how would Facebook's metaverse come into play with their future revenue? So with Facebook's metaverse, I miss not really the scope of the presentation, but I will say that consumer is probably one of the harder areas for the metaverse. I would be more into industrial side of things. Um, I did a great NVIDIA interview on that. Uh, I'm just more interested in that um, side because consumers, we don't know if consumers want to spend time in the metaverse. Uh, they didn't really care for virtual reality. Um, so if as an investor who needs to see real gains and real returns, um, you know, because it's my livelihood, I am more interested in the industrial virtual world. Those are things like BMWs, virtual factory, um, which is something that they do to help optimize their factories. Um, autonomous vehicles are trained in simulation platforms, things like that.
can you please explain Shry why? Can you explain Snap versus HubSpot versus Roku versus Pubmatic? Which one has the most future runway? Well, they all have a lot going for them, really. Um, but you're dealing with a publisher. Um, you're dealing with Roku, who's technically a publisher and also an operating system and also an ad platform with one view. So Roku is the full stack. And then Pubmatic is the supply side. So um, I will leave it to you to decide which one of those you think is the best. Um, I own two of those. So, um, and I've been usually pretty open as the ones I own. Um, if you go back and look at my research. I'm trying to avoid giving you guys um, exact stock tips because I think that you can do a lot with the information I presented. I think it can really help guide uh, many companies, some I own, some I don't own because there's only a limited amount of companies I can own in a 20 position portfolio. Um, let's see here. Do you expect some consolidation in ad tech done by Facebook, AKA buying some companies to boost up the ad revenue if yes, do you have any certain sides of ad tech in mind where the consolidation might happen? Like, will Facebook try to acquire more first party revenue? Uh, I'm sorry, first party data. I think even if they did that piece that I said, where on one instance, I'm on a different site and I'm, you know, New York Times and I'm looking at financial information and then I'm over on Expedia and I'm looking at booking a trip to Hawaii, that stuff would be hard to, um, retain at this point. So because the ID is not uh, being shared, um, the attribution pieces. So it's being cleansed basically of personal, you know, personalized information. Apple's keeping that. So in that way, I think that um, it would be hard to acquire what audience network was doing, but we'll see. Uh, someone's asking about um, direct response versus brand dollars. Will Facebook shift to brand advertising? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, some of that stuff is hard to say. Uh, I'm just trying to give an overview of the current landscape. Um, how, I, again, as far as brand advertising goes, I guess my favorite would be connected to the ads and some of the activity going on there. Someone is saying Facebook is already down a lot, about 15% in a couple of days. Do you think the earnings can lower the price more? So I can't really make earnings calls, but I think they've got, I mean, they, I'll take it from the horse's mouth. They said they have sub substantial headwinds. I believe that that's true. Um, I think I had shown someone that when I first covered Facebook in 2018, I covered NVIDIA. If you'd put your money in, in NVIDIA, you do have about 450% returns, even with the current sell-off compared to 28% with Facebook. So I think Facebook has more headwinds to go. Um, believe it or not, when I first started writing about these two stocks, it was the opposite. Facebook continued to be the Wall Street darling and NVIDIA continued to get beat up. So it takes a long time. This is a four-year thesis. So tech takes a long, long time. Um, just talking about a product the other day with the premium members. I first started covering it in September of 2019, and it just started to accelerate in revenue uh, meaningfully to the point where I think it'll continue to do so for a long time. And it took th like two and a half years. I mean, it's just nuts because what's nuts is not that, that it takes that long, but that the Wall Street expects anything less, um, expects tech to not behave like tech. Um, with these shorter earnings reports. Um, there's a battle between venture capitalists and Wall Street where venture capitalists think quarterly earnings reports are just absolutely insane for a tech company because on such a short leash is really tough for product. Would Google's privacy move have different effects in Apple's because they don't own the handsets? Um, I think Google's privacy will have an equal, if not greater effect because browser, um, would take down another pillar. Um, and that remaining pillar um, is kind of what some people are holding on to now, if that makes sense. So if you lose the mobile pillar, you've got the browser. Um, Apple has made quite a bit of changes to their browser, but not many people use Safari compared to Chrome.
Um, how does the trade desk work with first and third party data? Well, the trade desk is on the demand side. So a lot of that's third party data, but it's also mainly browser and connected TV. They've stated their exposure to iOS is not as high as you would think. So um, they feel more equipped to overcome right now the iOS changes. But if I was a trade desk investor, um, I'm not making a call at all. I would just keep an ear on anything with Chrome. Um, I think they actually just got into a little debate or some kind of argument with Google over that. I can't remember what the details were, but my first thought was because Trade Desk is um, more reliant on Chrome and browsers, but you can check me on that and make sure I'm right on those segments. I believe browser is more important than the Trade Desk. Um, I do have a guess on Netflix SSQ. I'm not going to share it. <laughs> um, where does Roku fit into this? Roku owns the whole stack. So there's the bear case and there's the bull case with Roku. You guys know I'm a bull. I've been talking about Roku for years. Um, the bear case, so I'll start with that, is valid. It's that user growth is going to be tough um, because they have to get hardware and smart TVs into people's living rooms. So there's an extra element than people who just have to download an app like Netflix or whatever else. Um, that extra element is enough of a headwind that um, the bears kind of whatever feeds the bears, if you will, that that headwind. Um, the positives to Roku is they own so much of the stack that their first party data is superior to almost anyone else's data out there. Um, and that's because they own the operating system so they can continue to see your activity across apps when you're on their operating system um, and they're moving more omni channel. So they're pixel, which means that you can run ads and then run attribution beyond seeing the ad on the CTV. Um, just in general, they have really strong data. So you have to determine which camp you're in. Do you think the hardware is too difficult? Um, and is it, is it too hard to get that into people's living rooms? Or do you think the first party data is so um, superior that it's going to um, you know, win out in the long run? Um, so I, I think the first party data is so valuable that I, I like to go with data. I mean, everything about Facebook's epic Wall Street run was about data. Everything about Google's epic Wall Street run was because of data. So I'm just really, I, my, high, my, my preference is as an investor when it comes to media is data and audience. Um, it's just uh, the way that I prefer to invest. Um, not everyone has that style. That's totally fine. Someone's saying in the graphic you shared for the ad tech landscape, is anything interesting to you except the supply side platforms? You don't have to give out names, just sectors. Yeah, I mean, the publishers. So, I mean, I publishers are, you know, going to be um, more, uh, more attractive, I guess, or, you know, going direct to publishers or not direct, but publishers packaging up their segments, selling them whatever way they want to sell them is, I think the trend that we will see into the foreseeable future, it will take one to two years for that full transition. But if the market's forward looking, why not start looking at this space now? Um, that is why, if you guys remember, Facebook fell off a cliff last earnings, Snap went up 58%. That is why, is because they were able to reiterate their 50% guide and uh, over the next few years and Facebook cannot. So. You're already starting to see evidence of it. So keep keep looking for it. It doesn't have to be uh, Snap or Pinterest or Roku. Um, you could look at the trade desk and decide that's a good stock for yourself. You could look at Pubmatic, things like that. I'm just trying to give you guys some direction on what I think is happening. Um, it would seem that Amazon would have a front row seat for first party data considering Amazon could provide consumer packaged goods companies with buyers of their products. These CPG companies would be looking to direct more advertising money to Amazon. Um, you mentioned all other things, but rarely mentioned Amazon. You know, the reason I don't is because it has so many different segments. It's mainly the AWS segment that can confuse the overall revenue. So you're you're right that Amazon should be discussed. It's just it's not a pure play um, enough for me to think of it in this discussion, but um, yeah, I, I'm actually surprised. I'll just throw this out. I'm actually surprised that Amazon hasn't come under more regulation just because it 
has used data from one area outside of others. So just to be constantly swapping data without permission seems a little strange to me, but I am a privacy advocate. I actually used to speak in San Francisco about privacy. So I, I am biased there about privacy. And then if Amazon gets into healthcare, like how can that happen? Um, if you were a consumer and they took your data and now they're using your healthcare data, I don't think that should be right. I don't think that's right, but that's a personal thing. But ultimately, yeah, Amazon has a lot of first party data um, and you are correct on that. Why is Google delaying and making similar changes to Android as Apple has done for IDFA? Um, hmm, I don't know it. I don't know. I don't know if I can answer that other than Apple might have more of a motivation. Um, Apple might be sitting there. I mean, I do actually, I, I do think I know. Apple has, is probably sitting there wondering why am I letting all these other people make money on my real estate? And now that my iPhone is a little bit flat, my big, my big segment, I'm gonna start trying to get capture the app store revenue. But the other thing is that Google is the other third party data, per, you know, they're, they're, they are gonna get hurt from what Apple is doing a little bit, but they are matched, if not greater, than audience network with their third party network. So they're not as incentivized. They, they are the problem and they are now going to also be the solution. So how does this help or hurt someone like digital turbine? Um, uh, you know, digital turbine isn't really in my coverage. I have looked at them, but I'm not going to be able to answer that right now. Uh, in a meaningful way. Um, where can we see the holdings of the IO fund? Is that published? We, apologies if I missed this, we discussed the returns of the portfolio, um, but we keep the positions for the premium people. Um, NVIDIA short term, I think NVIDIA is very strong and Bradley at our company, um, he has put out quite a bit of research on big tech CapEx. So speaking of Facebook and Google, they are spending a lot on their data centers and building those up. And um, it's actually kind of surprising how much they're spending. Um, but if you look up um, some of what Bradley has published, it's actually really very strong evidence that data center growth is quite healthy this year. So uh, we're not willing to move from that position right now based on that one analyst who had said something about some orders getting canceled. We think the big tech, uh, yeah, big tech CapEx is so strong. And then you've got incredible tailwinds coming down the line for automotive. So watch for an analysis of mine on that. Uh, I'd like to discuss with my free newsletter subscribers why I think NVIDIA will power the majority of the automotive market, which is quite a big statement, but I truly think that. Will the recorded webinar be shared with participants? Um, yes, but we're trying to decide if we share it beyond those who participated and signed up just to thank you for your support and thank you for listening in. Um, so no one can invest directly in the IO fund, but they can mirror the portfolio. Yes, yep, they, you can mirror our portfolio. But ultimately, too, I think where we try to add value is just showing you the trends. And we'll often say, like, cybersecurity is strong, and here's a few to consider, and we can only own 20 uh, across multiple um, sectors, or I should say tech verticals. So uh, we try to give you the tools and empower you with the actual research so that you can make those decisions and uh, on your own as well. Um, is valuation a factor when you choose a company to invest or is it purely on the business potential? Yeah, valuation is definitely a factor. I think I'd come out on like Cloudflare and Snowflake and a few others when they were super high. And I said, man, I would love to own this company, you know, if it was lower and well, it's lower. So it's very lower. Um, so I will frequently do a little bit of research and a really good example is, uh, let's see, I think it was, data dog that we ended up buying during the COVID sell-off. Um, so I always have like, oh, an AMD too. It was at one point it had just been ripping and uh, there was a big sell-off. And I, I usually have a couple in the bank or I should say a couple on the side that I'm waiting for their valuations to come down. Um, so.
cool. Let me just see if I've missed anything here. Um, let's see. I think that's all. So um, I just want to say thanks, everyone, uh, for joining. And I really appreciate it. And um, we'll get the replay out soon. So thank you so much and take care.